everybody. Thanks so much for listening to When I Grow Up. Uh, today, in today's episode, I have a special guest. His name is Bernard Lee, and he is a thermal engineer, correct? A thermal engineer. That's correct. Um, with Lockheed Martin. And look, I'm not even going to try to pretend that I know what that is. So... Bernard is here to tell me uh, more about it. Bernard, how are you? Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I am doing just fine. Oh, and good. A thermal engineer is actually exactly what it sounds like. I just make sure whatever I'm working on does not get too cold or too hot. And that's it. That's like simple terms, huh? <laughs> um, so you are based out of where are you from or where, where do you live right now? I'm I'm in a little town called Littleton, which translates into little town. Right. So Self fulfilling prophecy there. <laughs> uh, in Colorado. Nice. Um. So you work for Lockheed Martin. What kind of company is Lockheed Martin? Do they? So, yeah. Well, Lockheed Martin is a, a defense contractor primarily. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, we build. Um, satellites, fighter jets, uh, missiles, um, all that cool stuff. And uh, I have the privilege of working in their uh, deep space exploration uh, division. So cool. I think you might be the coolest person I know. (laughs) You you need to get to know more people. (laughs) No, I mean, okay, so um, Bernard works for... Uh, Lockheed Martin, and he works on spacecrafts, okay? And he told me that he, you're working on two projects specifically right now, right? Yeah, currently. Uh, um, should I go into yes, a little Yes, please, bit? please do. Right. Um, so uh, I, I am currently operating um, two spacecraft, Martian spacecraft, um, that you, the taxpayer, paid for. So thanks for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, the first, first one's called, uh, insight and that is a Mars lander. Um, and the second, uh, second vehicle is called Maven and that is a Mars orbiter. One of three that we have over there. I mean, um, yeah. So like you're talking really like nonchalantly about how you work on spacecrafts. But for me, like you are working, so Lockheed Martin is contracted by NASA, I'm assuming. Correct. And so you technically work for NASA. No. They're they're the customer. Okay, you're the the customer. You're right. Yeah. But like this is, is this not like a little kid's dream come true? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, like, it's amazing to me. I'm, like, so blown away. And I looked into it today. I wanted to, like, kind of know a little bit about it. And um, I looked into it with my son, Eli, who's three years old. And we were watching some of the videos, and he was just mesmerized. He was like, wow, what is that? I was like, I know. You want to build a spacecraft? (laughs) Yeah, um, it is so fascinating. The insight you said was a Mars lander, right? Yeah, it is on the surface of the Martian planet. So, um, currently, right now, right now, as we speak, I am operating it right now. Okay, so what just is that to mean? the right of my microphone, I have my computer just tracking how it's doing. So, like when you say you operate it, like what does that entail? Um, well, okay. So first of all, flying a spacecraft is not at all like what you would think it is from the movies. There's no joystick. There is no, uh, red button. There's uh-huh. none of that. Um, it, 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 it's, uh, it takes a team of engineers to, um, okay. So a spacecraft is literally just a giant box. Right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And forget the fact that it's in it's in a completely uh, different environment. It's it, it. You've got a team of engineers trying to keep the spacecraft alive and working properly um, from Earth. And so for me, as a thermal engineer, I I look at what we call telemetry data 
um, people in the, in the health field are going to know what that is. Um, where I, I I've got, um, a bunch of temperature sensors mm-hmm. all around the spacecraft. Okay. Uh, strategically placed. And every once in a while I receive data from the spacecraft mm-hmm. showing me, um, how hot or how cold each part of that spacecraft is. Um, at, and, uh, and I have my computer model. I run simulations. And so I basically make sure that everything that's happening on the spacecraft right now, mm-hmm. I have already predicted before. Uh. So it, so reality is matching my predictions um, from like um, the prior week or something. Because we never do anything with the spacecraft without first uh, um, confirming that we can um, through my simulations, through uh, the the power teams uh, simulations, through flight software, through telecom, they all run their numbers. We all run our numbers, and and uh, once we all give the green light, then and only then um, do we execute you know certain maneuvers or or um, yeah um, or 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 we command the spacecraft to do X, Y, and Z tasks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Once we confirm that it is safe to do so. Man. So, you know, how long is that process? Like, and you have to do all this preparation before this spacecraft actually is like set into motion and goes to space. Like how, how long does that take? Like building you mean, it? Like, like from <laughs> inception? Yeah. So the so there's a couple ways to answer that. <laughs> so um every spacecraft that well, I want to say most of the spacecraft that gets put out there by NASA was dreamt up by the lead principal investigator from NASA like 15 years prior. Okay. And then like throughout the years that engineer or that scientist has to, um, um, come up with ways to, to convince all of NASA Mm -hmm. to award his idea, his program, um, the, um, X amount of dollars to, to make that mission become a reality. And so, um, so these missions are, are, are long dreamt up like 15, 20 years ago, maybe, um, however, once you get the, the funding from NASA, mm-hmm. um, um, so you got, you got three tiers of, of, of NASA missions. You've got okay. the lowest mission, the lowest class, which is called, um, discovery. Okay. Uh, and discovery missions are the, I guess they're the cheapest. Okay. They're at, uh, $450 million. Oh, so cheap. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and those will take um, takes about a year and a half to two mm-hmm. years to to get this thing built and then launched. Um, and then the second tier is called uh, New Frontier. Yeah, the New Frontier missions are eight hundred fifty million dollars ish, and they might take two, three, maybe five. I don't want to say five, maybe three years, four years. They take a little longer to build. Okay. Um, is that because they're just more advanced or yeah, more advanced, okay. they're bigger. Um, and you have to design them to last longer usually. Mm. Um, so the insight lander is a discovery. Okay. Mission. It's, um, um, interesting as you're naming these tiers, they seem like the titles seem familiar to me. So I guess like, just like kind of the news and things like that, it's not completely foreign. Um, no. But um, that's so crazy. So you have the Insight and then the Maven. I know it's the orbiter going around Mars. Is that right? Correct. It's one of three orbiters we have around Mars right now. And uh, I also used to work on uh, a mission called Juno. Mm -hmm. And that is a um, orbiter around Jupiter. It is the only, uh, only spacecraft that mankind has out there right now 
Really? And yeah, I had the privilege of helping them. Um, so I didn't help build it. I didn't help design it. Um, I just helped fly it. And um, it was July 4th, 2016, um, when we uh, when we came up to Jupiter orbit insertion. So it took five years to get to Jupiter. And then um, all of it came down to one day where where um, our you know, our main engine had to fire perfectly. Everything had to go right in order to capture, in order to get captured in Jupiter's orbit. Because oh getting gosh. there is one thing, and then inserting yourself into orbit is a whole other thing. And you guys did that successfully. Yes. Oh well, my no, gosh! That no, is the crazy <laughs> the 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 giants before me mm-hmm. built it all and 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 made it possible so that younger people like me could come along and, 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 um, you know, help, uh, help get this thing, uh, sucked into Jupiter, Jupiter's orbit. So crazy. I didn't, that's yeah. insane to me. I mean, obviously, cause I'm not familiar with this world at all. Just hearing that about that. I mean, that seems like everything has to be perfectly timed, right. And like, a lot of it sounds like a lot of calculations is that right i don't know <laughs> oh yeah you don't you don't get a lot of uh you don't get to mess up very many times oh, here man. um and i mean if anyone listening to this is an engineer you're going to have taken an an engineering ethics course and and actually not just engineering ethics um uh most ethics courses in college will probably cover the challenger and mm. the Columbia disasters. Okay. We don't get, you're only going to get it wrong once. Right. Mm. And, and in the worst case scenario, you have lives at risk. And, um, thankfully, uh, everything I'm working on currently is unmanned. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I don't have that added stress. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, you don't want to be the one responsible for a critical, uh, critical error. Oh man. I didn't even, think of that yeah i mean if there's people in it too it's a whole nother level of yeah so (laughs) uh note to the to the wise out there don't be the first one to try and get to mars (laughs) (laughs) people always ask me would you ever want to go to space and i say i'll i'll wait for the first hundred failures first oh man and and then i'll consider it that's crazy. I mean, yeah, that's insane. So, Bernard, what does your day to day look like? A typical day for you um, at work? Yeah, what does it look like? Um, does it change every day? Is that why? <laughs> not every day. It, it it changes on it changes on, depend depending on what mission I'm working on. Uh huh. And what phase of the mission it is on. So, uh, so as a uh, spacecraft thermal engineer in deep space exploration, I can um, I can be working on designing future missions. I can be um, helping build the spacecraft. I can be helping test the spacecraft. I can be helping fly the spacecraft. Currently, both my missions are 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 um, you know in the flight flight operations phase right now. And so um, a typical day would look like me. Um, it It's all computer work. It's all desk work. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm bringing down data from my spacecraft to see um, what my temperatures look like mm-hmm. um, outside and inside the spacecraft. And if anything's, if anything's off, I make a note of that in, you know, in my, in my reports, mm-hmm. or if everything's good and we're, we're good to go. Um, I, you know, I, I explain that we are and why we are. And, uh, and I can also help. Um, well, I also help plan for the next week's task by, uh, running, uh, simulations on my computer. So for example, if someone says, I want to move this robotic arm five inches to the right, Mm -hmm. bring it down while having that computer on, while having that antenna working, 
at this time of day, Mm -hmm. I say, okay, hold on. Let me run that. Let me make sure that we're okay there. Mm -hmm. And then if if all temperatures look good and we're not exceeding any limits, cold and hot, I say, yes, uh, yay, verily, you may do that. Mm -hmm. And if we can't, I say, here's why we cannot. Um, So, so, yeah. If the temperatures are off, like, what could happen? Oh, (laughs) other than getting in a lot of trouble uh, from NASA. Um, (laughs) yeah. Um, like the, it could break or like something like, like that. Worst case scenario, absolute worst case scenario is you have some sort of hardware malfunction (gasps) on another planet. And so, um, I mean, for me as a thermal engineer, um, the hardwares that I'm, I'm responsible for are like, um, what we call blankets, space blankets. I mean, if you've seen any any uh, cartoon picture or or movie showing a spacecraft, you might notice like some shiny foil on the yeah, on yeah. the outsides of the spacecraft. Those are uh-huh. called thermal blankets. Okay. And um, a thermal engineer is responsible for putting those on. So that's my hardware, and mm-hmm. and also heaters on a spacecraft. Um, when I say heaters, I'm not talking about your 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 um uh the heater from your your thermostat i'm talking about like a car seat warmer kind okay, of heater okay so i got those around the spacecraft if any of those break or if any of uh um our thermostats break or act or because of my thermostats breaking i fry another chip <gasps> on accident That's like someone awesome. else's box uh then we're in serious trouble Oh my goodness. Has that ever happened? (laughs) Am I allowed to know these information? (laughs) Yeah. Nothing. First of all, nothing I work on is classified. Okay. okay. Um, um, it has happened. Not any person's fault. We've gotten unlucky several Mm -hmm. times where you just, you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. I mean, this thing is on literally on another planet. I can't even imagine the kind of work and stress and effort that needs to like, you, you have no, you literally, you have some control, but not really. So. Yeah. You're at the mercy of, of, of nature over there a lot. And, uh, nature there is very different from nature here. So. So, okay, you know what? I could like continue to go on and on and ask so many questions about <laughs> this. <laughs> but um, what I what I really do want to know too is, Bernard, did you always want to be a thermal engineer? Like at what point in your life were you like, this is the path I want to go towards and this is what I want to do? Did you know that in college or? Um. No, uh, no, I didn't always know. Okay. I wanted to be this. Um, so let's see here. Man, it was so long ago. Yeah, you can take us all the way back, all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> I, well, first of all, I grew up in the Silicon Valley. Uh huh. And so I was just surrounded by engineers, right? And, sure, and yeah. Who wanted to be lawyers and doctors. Um, and so. Um, I, I thought really you could only be one of those three things. And, mm-hmm. and I went engineering cause I didn't think I was smart enough to be a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I went down, I started, uh, in mechanical engineering. And then after my sophomore year, um, I landed an internship with Lockheed Martin in California. Oh, wow. Doing something similar. Um, I was, I was in a thermal engineering group and then I really liked the influence I had over there and, uh, or the influence that they had on me over Mm -hmm. there. And, and so when I went back to school, uh, for my junior year, I decided to switch to aerospace engineering. Um, but, and, and the engineers listening to this are going to understand that that was unnecessary because, um, Thermal engineering is actually more a part of mechanical engineering than it is oh. uh, aerospace um, in, in terms of coursework. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted so I switched to an aerospace engineering major my junior year, but then 
uh, in my fifth year, uh, yeah, I stayed five years, thoroughly There's retaking, shame in that. thoroughly <laughs> retaking classes. Um, I actually wanted to be a dentist. What? Uh, I wanted, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I wanted to uh, get my degree in aerospace engineering, take two years of community college courses like bio and chem, uh-huh. and, you know, that I hadn't taken in years. And then, and then eventually make my way into dental school. Um, wow. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that fell through um, after I graduated. Um, for, Why is that? Yeah. Oh, that's a whole, that's such a long story, but okay. uh, we'll just say, we'll just say, um, I'm glad it fell through. Okay, yeah. And, and I mean, another part of me wanted to be a musician, mm. um, but um, I'm sure your 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 audience is going to understand that there's no way that I was going to fly with an Asian mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wait. But let's go back to for you know you saying you wanted to be a musician in your head. What did that look like as a career? You wanted to do that? Yeah, I thought about it. Oh wow. I well, like in what? Like what kind of musician? Um, well, m- prob- I mean, I wanted to uh, explore the world of touring, oh. uh, either on yeah guitar or 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 keys, um, and and uh, um, the idea of music production um, it has always been and still is very uh, intriguing to me, um, but. I, I am glad that I chose to keep it a hobby. Some oh. people are wired to be able to handle mm. um, being a musician professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, I am not. Okay. I've learned. Um, I I get to play music with some of the greatest musicians on the planet uh, every weekend, and 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 uh, and they are they are built for it. Mm. I need. I needed to keep uh, music as an escape. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Wait, so, so that, you play music on the weekend? Sorry, I'm just so interested. <laughs> oh, you're good. You're good. Yeah. Um, I, I play with uh, uh, with my church here in Colorado. Nice. Um, they are legit. Um, this is. A sh- Am I allowed to do a shameless plug here? Oh, no, absolutely. All right. Everyone, go check out Red Rocks Worship. Oh, you play with Red Rocks Worship? Sometimes. That's yeah. awesome. I know Red Rocks. You know them? Yeah, of course. My yeah. husband also uh, plays worship music. So we try to keep our genres, you know, at large. And yeah. That's awesome. <gasps> Bernard, you're even cooler than I thought. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're all a bunch of weirdos on stage. This, okay, this. but you, so that's awesome. So you play keys for them, or what um, you, mostly, yeah. Okay, because I do remember in college that you played piano. Um, that I do remember. You guys, that, I don't that's even. That's very generous. If I don't you're <laughs> that playing piano. No, no. I mean that. I mean, okay. So I should mention, um, Bert, Bernard and I. We met during our college years, but we were talking about it before. We don't even really know how we how we met. We we met through campus ministry, but I don't know when or where or what the yeah, situation was. Um, but he went to UCLA and I went to UCI, and so we were even not even on the same campus. So um, what I do remember. The little I do remember of our interactions was that he was playing the piano, the keys. But anyway, so now you're doing that on the weekends and being a yeah. thermal engineer during during the week. Yes, so <laughs> so it things worked out. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so you weren't a dent you didn't go into dentistry. No. And you nixed the music idea. Uh in the in the sense yeah. of going professionally as yes. a full-time career. Correct. Okay. Um, and now you are looking for a job after you graduate. Is that where we're going with this story? Oh, you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so, uh, uh, yeah, I forgot. Um, once I graduated, thankfully, the the same group that gave me an internship three years prior, right. they, uh, they, they welcomed me back. Um, 
Wow. Yeah, you must have done good one. work, Bernard. <laughs> well, well, I don't know because that group is, no, is now defunct. Oh, but, okay. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they invited me back and I was with them for about four years there um, in California. And then in about 2014, August of 2014, I moved out here um, to take this uh, uh, planetary exploration um, job here. So, so, okay. So, like, I mean, not everyone can get this job, I feel. <laughs> well, if anything, I, I might be proof that. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, like, how, how did you. So, when you were in California, you weren't working with spacecrafts, correct? I was servicing you? spacecraft that were already in space. I so see. I okay. provided a yeah a particular service. Okay, so you there was experience there before you moved to Colorado. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, man. So, you know, do you face um, any challenges, like personally, like I mean, I, and professionally? Like, is there something that you feel like? Yeah, it's challenging as a thermal engineer. Oh, yeah. Um, well, professionally, everyone there is just so incredibly smart. Yeah, I bet. And <laughs> the, demand, the demand for excellence is mm. incredibly high. And mm. so, it, so there's a lot of stress that comes with that. Um, however, everyone I work with is just so in, incredibly encouraging to me. Mm. Like... Um, yeah, so there, I'm just so blessed to have such a cool job with such a high demand for excellence, with such a cool group of people who understand my struggles and and are there to help me through it. And so it's just like I don't know. I'm just so thankful to have such a a, a healthy environment like that. Can I ask, are you like on the younger side of the team? Like, or, or, um, or is yeah. everybody your age? Or Well, it's interesting because um, up until maybe two, three years ago, maybe four years ago, I mean, we had a real problem, uh, not just at Lockheed Martin, but in the whole aerospace industry itself. Um, I, I think the numbers were just so staggering, like some 60% of the company would be eligible for retirement or something or something crazy high. And, uh, over the past couple of years, I've seen a massive influx of just younger engineers. Mm. Um, and so that's been cool to see. Yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so that's professionally, but what about personally? I guess it's kind of goes hand in hand, maybe the internal struggle of just kind of, questioning if you are fit for the job is that what you were trying to explain or oh yeah every year i <laughs> i take like an inventory of you know of of what's inside me and and every year i question like should i really be here like should i really be here because i got lucky because everyone in my building knows that there are so many smarter people than them outside of where we work. And so you cannot deny that, that, that we are all lucky or we are lucky to not have gotten unlucky mm -hmm. in our journey to get here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, I can, I can think of so many people who would be way more qualified, mm -hmm. um, uh, like technically qualified to, uh, to be doing my job. But, um, and so, and so the, um, the self-imposed guilt of that um, weighs way too heavily on my heart. Um, I give it way more credit than I should. Um, um, what else? Um, personal, personally, um, I mean, occasionally you'll run into to uh, people at work that you just don't want to talk to because they're, they're mean. <laughs> Yeah. A bunch of meanies. <laughs> oh no. Um, yeah. Man, I I I had something that you wanted that I, to say. That I wanted to say to this. 
and I forgot it, of course. If you think of it, we can come back. No worries. But yeah. um, my questions are kind of all over the place as well. I'm sorry about that. But um, another thought came to my mind that I wanted to ask you about your education. And was there like, did you have to go to grad school or anything? Not for what I do, no. Oh, um, wow. That's surprising for me just because, you know, you're working on spacecrafts. But <laughs> but yeah. A lot of my, a lot of my colleagues and I have only had undergrad degrees. Mm. Uh, we've been in the game for so long that going back for a grad degree, grad degree in our field would be kind of useless. Uh. It, my if I if I had one regret on that, it's that I didn't try to go to grad school earlier, like within the first two years of my, um, you know, of working for Lockheed Martin, because, um, um, then, um, the pay rise that would come from that would be much greater than, or would be much more felt than, than me in my ninth year now, I guess, nine, 10, I don't know. <gasps> Crazy. Yeah. If I were to try and go for a grad degree now i i'm confident i can do well however i'm not sure it would be worth it okay so um that makes yeah. sense that makes it's just a cost analysis there yeah uh, um so yeah. um other than uh a pay raise in just even your having your master's um do you think educationally it would have been beneficial if you had gone like in that first two years or oh, yeah okay. yeah it would have it it definitely would have helped if I were to have gone for a, a master's degree in my field within the first two years. Hundred percent would have helped me, mm. uh, not just not just uh, with uh, with my salary, but also just with my overall uh, um, you know expertise, my my overall knowledge. Um, that being said, I would not rule out going back to school for something different, like uh, like an MBA or something. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Really? That was more for the audience than, okay. than me. <laughs> I'm so done with school. Yeah. I, but I understand that. I mean, too. I was after undergrad, I was like, okay, let's just move on here. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, oh, man, I kind of, I, I want to ask more about this, the spacecraft. You what, you, this is your podcast. <laughs> You can do whatever you want. Um, like, oh, oh, I saw that you won an award or something. Yeah. Did I make that up? No, but it doesn't mean anything. What do you mean? Awards doesn't are mean just anything. awards. They're, they're it's paperweight. You are just underestimating your own work, Bernard. <laughs> but, yeah. But that's really cool, too. What was the re award for? Just tell tell me. <laughs> you don't even remember. Well, I, I it's difficult to remember because these awards come like a year late. So <laughs> <laughs> this one, this particular one that I'm guessing you're you're referring to, was when our Maven team um, helped execute a particular maneuver around Mars. Uh, so okay, so here's Mars. Okay. Right, my fist is Mars. Okay. And um, at the time, we were doing something called deep dip maneuvers. So, okay, let's just say this is the North Pole. My face is the North Pole. Okay. Y'all are the South. Okay. okay. So that means um, our orbit used to look like this. It would go right above the planet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, and then go way out here and then just above the planet, just nick the atmosphere every time we come in close. Uh -huh. Okay. That, that was part of the primary science mission. And then uh, somebody in, well, Congress and in their infinite wisdom, uh -huh. someone up there <laughs> said, hey, we want Maven, uh, which was not designed for, uh, for task B, to be able to do task B and survive until 2030 or something. And we're like, okay, that's nearly impossible. And we don't have, we don't have a fuel for that. Blah, 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 blah. We can't do that. It wasn't designed for that. 
But then eventually we figured out that we can. So it, basically, in order to in order to complete or in order to execute task B, uh-huh. we needed to change our orbit drastically. And there are two ways you can do that. One, you use your boosters, your your rocket fuel. Um, but if we're trying to survive through 2030, uh-huh. we need to save as much rocket fuel as we can. So we needed to try and change our orbit a completely different way. And we managed to figure that out using uh, um, a previously uh, previously um, practiced well, so there was another mission way before us that tried a maneuver called aerobraking, and and some of some of the space nerds listening to this are, are going to understand what that is. We use the atmosphere as we're coming in hot; the friction of that atmosphere slows us down. Okay. Right, and th- and if we time it just right, and if we get that altitude just right, that will be what helps change our orbit. So, so the tiniest push from here or through rocket fuel from here, that, that's all it takes to, to, to change your orbit. And so, um, basically the award was for the Maven team figuring out and successfully executing, um, a, uh, and saving fuel while executing an aerobraking maneuver to change our orbit, to set us up for success for tasks B, C, D, E, F, G, H through 2030. That is insane and (laughs) award-worthy. If you save rocket fuel, you save money. If you save money, that looks looks good for your team. And uh, more more importantly, that looks good for your vice president. Sure. (laughs) And, and, And yeah, and someone up there decided to give us an award to uh to yeah. keep us happy. <laughs> Prior to that award, we had to make our own awards. Like there's like 15 20 of us. Uh-huh. There was no recognition. We're like we j- I wonder if I have it. It's at my office, but uh-huh. we we made little coasters, like uh-huh. literally cardboard coasters <laughs> with with uh good quality ink on it and we said <laughs> And it and it said, I made Maven arrow breaking look easy, and all I got for it was this was stupid this poster. poster. <laughs> no, we had to treat ourselves. Oh man! So and okay, we, uh, you did it successfully. Like when it happened, like what was that emotion? Like, weren't you? Were you like? I mean, I would just be elated. I feel like, but w- what was it f- like for your team? I don't know. I, honestly, uh-huh. when it when it when it was confirmed that it worked, uh-huh. I was, I was working on insight. Oh <laughs> so, man. So it was anticlimactic altogether. <laughs> I mean, you got to understand like you're, it, the, you, yes, there are moments for celebration, uh-huh. but then it's, it's just right on to the next thing. Right. And so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I found out it was pretty exciting, but, um, tell you what was more exciting was when we successfully landed on Mars. When oh yeah, tell Insight me about landed that. on Mars. That was that was thrilling. Um, um, it was November. It was three days after Thanksgiving. Uh huh. Twenty eighteen. Eighteen. How'd you know? I did my research. <laughs> Look at you. Look at you. Um. Yeah. We uh, had to cancel Thanksgiving plans. We had to cancel Christmas plans. Some of us did, and uh, but when we landed, um, so you got to understand, it takes. Huh. Sorry, I. Okay, I got it. So. Depending on where the planets line up, um, a radio signal uh, takes, I don't know, between 7 to 20 minutes to get from here to to Mars. So what that means is, so that's how long it takes light to travel from Earth to Mars. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, Depending on which side of the sun you're both at, 
And um, at the time, I believe it took, uh, let's just say 10 minutes. If anything happened to our spacecraft at Mars, we wouldn't know about it for 10 minutes. Mm. Um, And so we don't know for 10 minutes if our spacecraft survived the landing or not. Oh my gosh. And so that is already <laughs> just a uh just a stressful wait. Not only that, but our spacecraft took a little over 6 months to get from Earth to Mars. Okay. And then so it it was a 6 month long trip. And then uh and then it takes 7 minutes um to get from uh, the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. That seven minutes uh, is what we call the seven minutes of terror. Yeah. And uh, because, because everything go, um, from Earth until Mars, that whole trip, which we call cruise, mm-hmm. um, everything during cruise, we, we still have a lot of time to, to adjust some things on board the spacecraft um, by sending it commands. But once you get to the entry, descent, and landing window, that seven minutes, it's all autopilot. It's all automatic or automated. And everything that was uh, coded while this thing was still on Earth, to, um, you know, it, it will execute. And, and so you have no control. There's no joystick. And so um, you're, you, you've got your fingers crossed. You're, you're praying that, that years and years of, of hard work and coding and double checking and debugging uh, makes your spacecraft calculate its, you know, figure out its balance perfectly, figures out which thrusters to fire to adjust its, adjust its attitude perfectly. Um, and your spacecraft needs to know exactly when to, when to pop the, the lid to expose the legs. Uh, it needs to know exactly when to deploy the parachute. Everything is, is uh, is automated and so that seven minutes of terror i mean we're all just holding our breath in the mission ops room and then a couple minutes uh go by until we receive uh, uh a little pulse uh a little heartbeat from our spacecraft saying i'm okay i made it here's <gasps> here's a little diagnostic thing and then we just erupted in that room i would have cried i feel <laughs> Like that's, that's, I mean, I'm about to cry right now. I mean, I just feel like all that hard work, if it had been unsuccessful, right? Like, I mean, no words. I feel like no words. <laughs> I I can't imagine. This is crazy. Just reliving it right now. In right. Head. Right. Uh, yeah. I don't know what I would have done if, if something would have gone. I don't know what I would have done if something were to have gone wrong because of a thermal problem. Oh yeah. Like a heater didn't work properly or like a, a like a blanket fell off or, or something. <sighs> I, I don't know. So Bernard, are you the only thermal engineer? Currently, yeah, but I mean, I have I have higher level engineers uh, above me who uh-huh. I consult and, okay. and who check in once in a while just to make sure that that everything's going good. That is that, mind that. blowing, though. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, I mean, like, yeah, I know that. I'm sure. Yeah, you would just if it was because of something, you know, a miscalculation on your part. I would. I mean, not to just. Yeah. <laughs> oh, trust me. I've had my miscalculations. I've I've been grilled by NASA, and it's not fun to have the weight of NASA on you. <laughs> yeah, oh, you just man. Yeah, you just uh, yeah, you just take it in. Yeah, I mean, you know, at all work, everybody's work has its has its you know, what do you call it? I mean, if you mess up. A lot of work situations, it's, unless it's like you're a doctor, I guess, <laughs> like it's not crazy, crazy. You get in big trouble, but this is like billions of dollars, <laughs> like at stake. And yeah, um, and I might add that I did say Insight was four hundred fifty million dollars because it's Discovery class. Mm-hmm. But there's an asterisk next to the Insight name. In your research, I don't know if you if you stumbled upon this or not, but we were supposed to launch in 2016. 
Oh. And then that launch got scrubbed, uh, meaning canceled at the time because there was a, a payload. There, there was a science instrument that was being built by the French that was not completed in time. And so we, without that instrument, there is no mission. And so we couldn't launch uh, on, it was supposed to be March of 2016. And so NASA scrubbed the launch. The launch. But the big deal there is if you scrub a launch to Mars, you can't, you cannot launch again just the next month because you have to wait for the planets to align <gasps> and they don't align in a favorable launch. Uh, you know, um, they, they don't align favorably for launch, uh, for 26 months. That's why we launched in May of 2018. And that's why the next Mars mission that NASA is launching, which I'm not a part of, by the way, is 2020, this year, July. So another 26 months after that. And so you don't just get to go to Mars whenever you want, right? We're talking celestial mechanics here, orbital mechanics. Everything has to line up. That is insane. Yeah. So our due dates are a little different. They're right. a little tighter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. Man. Um so all this information that is being collected by these spacecrafts, um, what what is what it's what I'm sorry I can't talk. What is its purpose? <laughs> right, like that's the um, multi billion dollar question. Oh, oh, is it? I well, thought it I mean, I mean, that's question. what the taxpayer would like to know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, for me, I'm like space exploration. I mean, it's cool, you know, like to be for education. I mean, now that I have my own children, too, and my son was watching these videos and he was super excited. And like, act I'm not even joking, Bernard, after watching just even like the same video of the insight is an informational video, <laughs> like four times um after that he could not stop talking about it today and um anyway even for me i'm like yeah like you know exposes him to to more things that are happening around him and creation and things like that and um so for me i'm like I guess, but I'm sure the higher up some people that make more money than I do would be concerned with what's happening with this information. But ultimately, like, is there a overall arching like purpose or is it just for educational use? Well, so to answer that, it's probably going to piss off some people. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so first of all, if it was solely for the expansion of knowledge, if mm -hmm. it was solely for just education, it would already be worth it. Now, on top of that, we are learning more and more about the solar system. Mm -hmm. Every planet that we visit, every moon that we visit, and every asteroid and comet that we visit is another piece to the puzzle. It's another way of, of learning more about the, the genesis of the solar system. And in Mars, in the particular case of Mars, because it just seems, because it's so similar to Earth in so many ways and so different in others, we want to know, so the, so, the whole point of the MAVEN spacecraft was to study the atmosphere mm -hmm. of Mars. And one of the biggest questions is why does Mars not have a, um, oh gosh, is it ionosphere, magnetosphere? I forget. One it's of those okay. spheres. Okay. <laughs> or, or several layers of atmosphere that Earth has the luxury of having because. Mm -hmm. Our, our ionosphere and our magnetosphere protects us from the sun's harmful rays. Mm -hmm. And Mars is so much farther away from the sun, and yet it gets 
bombarded and cooked and toasted by the sun's harmful rays way more than we do here on earth. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are we headed towards that same desolation? Mm -hmm. Right. And if we are, how long would that take? Um, and, and also, um, surface assets that we send there like insight and, and rove and Mars rovers, for example, uh, we're studying, you know, the, the geology of Mars and in insights case, we're studying the interior of the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, we're studying Mars quakes and we're studying, um, uh, temperature gradients through the soil, um, near the surface of Mars. And, and, uh, we've got, we've got special, uh, instruments on top of our spacecraft that look up and stare at the sky and they 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 measure and study the the wobble of the planet every planet has a wobble and so mars quakes is you can essentially call it the heartbeat of the planet you you take you take someone's heartbeat you take someone's temperature and you take someone's uh uh uh, you measure someone's reflexes, mm-hmm. you learn a lot about that person. Mm-hmm. And so what we're trying to do is study the interior of the planet. Mm-hmm. All missions that have gone to Mars prior to InSight know a lot from the surface and up. Um, no mission has ever studied the interior of Mars. And so all the information that InSight brings in, um, um, in conjunction with MAVEN and, and Mars Reconnaissance, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and Odyssey and, and, and all the, the Mars rovers, all the science that we bring back from that, eventually, hopefully, it's going to uh, help pave the way for, well, I know it will pay, help pave the way for astronauts um, when we first put boots on the surface there. That's um, can we survive there? Probably not on the surface. It will have to be either burrows that we dig or, or in cave systems that we find or, um, or some, or or create some really special artificial dome. Um, but also like, like is, is Mars the future of earth in terms of, of desolation and in terms of, uh, human colonization? Um, I think it's all important. And, and, uh, that Juno spacecraft I mentioned, uh, it is around Jupiter and we're studying Jupiter because Jupiter is so similar to our sun in terms of composition, a ton of hydrogen, a ton of helium. And so, uh, the, the idea was you study Jupiter, uh, and how and you try and study the formation of Jupiter. You'll eventually get, uh, you'll eventually, uh, learn more about, the formation of our sun and the solar system. And so how did we start? Why did we start? Um, how are we going to end? Mm. Why are we going to end? And all that. That's so much information. And yeah. it's so awesome though. And to the Christians out there, if something like that is what shakes your faith, you've got bigger fish to fry. Mm. That's good. Thank you. That's really good. Thanks Bernard for saying yeah. that. Um, you know, as you were talking about space, I am a little bit curious, like when you were younger, did you take an interest in like space and the solar system and things like that? Or is this something that just kind of happened as you took this job on? It Well, no kid is not fascinated by space. Me, I was not fascinated right. by space. All right. Maybe <laughs> figure skaters. Maybe. Um, I, I I attended a NASA space camp when I was in fourth grade. Had an awful time. <laughs> I hated it because I was a. I still am a huge introvert. Um, so space camp just oh, was not man. fun for me. Wait, so your parents uh, just like sent you to this, or you took? Yeah, the we lived. We didn't. I mean, we lived pretty close to NASA Ames uh, in the Bay Area, which uh-huh. yeah, hosted a space camp every summer interesting yeah and uh but yeah that i don't know i hated that so much (laughs) and honestly i my 
I mean, I was always interested in space, but I was never like going out of my way to study it. Okay. And then it just, it just kind of came with a job, yeah. honestly. I mean, have you like, has your interest in it? I mean, I would imagine has, has grown. Oh, oh, for sure. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Like I'm dreaming things that, sh- that I could have never dreamed before. Right, like, right. like I want to put, I want to put, um, um, a spacecraft around every known major celestial body in the solar system, like Neptune and Uranus. And it is pronounced Uranus, <laughs> uh, Neptune and Uranus. We don't know. We hardly know anything about those. Um, Neptune has this amazing moon called Triton. I think it's the largest moon in our solar system. That thing, we need to know more about that. Saturn, Enceladus, um, um, that's a that's an ocean world right there. Oh, oh, fun fact: there are a bunch of moons around our around our planets uh, in our solar system that are ocean worlds. Meaning, what the surface is just a like like miles and miles of ice crust, and beneath that is just H two O. No. Yeah, these tiny moons have more water inside them than all of Earth does, um, and so uh, we need to know what it what is out there. Are, are we going to find microbial life over there? If we do, did Enceladus, did Mars, did Titan have their own genesis, or did they somehow uh, get blasted there from Earth uh, when an asteroid hit or something? Um, yeah, we need to know these things. And so I mean, things I have never even like thought about, like ever, you know, cuz I'm not in that world, but it's so interesting. Uh, oh <laughs> man, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot out there. Uh what if, if anything this what this job provides this perspective. Yeah. Um just how small we are and how lucky we are and how blessed we are. Yeah. Um, so what is, do you have like a favorite part of what you do? Like what, what do you love the most? Everything? That's what I would say if I were you, but. <laughs> it's the fact that we are literally on the cutting edge of science. We mm-hmm. are expanding uh, science books. Your kid is going to read about our endeavors. Uh, I know, so cool. <laughs> yeah, most people don't realize. That most people here in Littleton don't realize that that um, that most of space exploration gets designed and built and tested and flown right out of here in Littleton, Colorado. Amazing. Um, that GPS technology in your phone, right out of Littleton, Colorado. Um, Amazing. Yeah. And so, uh, I'm just so blessed to be here, mm. like seriously. And so, um, yeah. So uh, what I love about my job is the big picture stuff. Mm. Yeah. The day to day stuff, not nearly as much, but the big picture stuff. No, and absolutely. I, yeah. And, and they provide, I mean, I'm just so thankful here. They provide pretty good work and life balance. Mm. So um like like as a culture like a work culture you're saying it's a it's a good well balance of no, uh so specifically i mean we work 980s uh-huh. um so for those who don't know what 980s are um so usually the standard american work week is um 5 days a week uh-huh 40 hours a week right uh-huh. um 980s are um uh, you don't actually work 40 hours a week. You work 80 hours every two weeks, but we get every other Friday off. Oh. And so, so, so Monday through Friday, right? In two weeks, we go nine, 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 eight, uh-huh. nine, 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 zero. Yeah. My dad works like that too. Exactly. I didn't know it had a name, but. Nine eighties. Yep. Wow. That's and, awesome. And I know there are some classified programs that work uh, 10 40s. So that, that's, um, 10 hours a day, four days a week. 
Um, That's yeah. what I mean. If you're working anyways, I feel like that would be awesome too. Like just to have that extra weekend day. Yeah. I mean, think about it. I get 26 Fridays off a year. That's amazing. Oh, seriously. Amazing. I know my husband would kill for that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I live right at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And so there's so much to do. I mean, seriously, there's, I mean, if I'm not at work, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, everyone go be a thermal engineer for Lockheed Martin. (laughs) But um, before we end, Bernard, um, our time together, I I always try to ask my guests um, if there's any advice that you would give um, someone that maybe is thinking about being an engineer or going into this field or even just life advice in general. Is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah, a couple things. Um, professional advice. Whatever company you work for owes you nothing Mm. and you don't owe it anything either. Like that's one thing I learned. Um, I know this is a little difficult to swallow, uh, especially at the smaller business level, like, like a mom and pop shop, Mm. but, and and this is going to sound really cold, but, but, do not get emotionally attached mm. to any one job. It owes you nothing and you owe it nothing. Mm. And so, um, yeah, um, I say that because too many people, too many young people get emotionally, emotionally mm. attached mm-hmm. to their, uh, to their job, to, to their team. And, and then before they know it, the, the company drops them. Mm. Um, yeah, that do not get emotionally attached to that. Um, do not get married to your work. Mm. Right? Um, I mean, I've got, I've got colleagues who <laughs> they, they've, uh, uh, quote unquote, been to Mars eight times. They, they've sent eight missions to Mars. They've sent missions to our moon, other moons, asteroids, comets. And and their greatest successes still come from their house. Yeah. Um, it, it's still with their family. Mm. And so in that same vein, I would also advise um, just uh, personal advice, life advice. Um, um, it, this, this is especially for the younger people out there. Yeah. Become a man of character. Yeah. Become a woman of character, mm. like character, seriously. Mm. Um, um, learn what it means to uh, pursue a life of integrity. Mm. And I mean that seriously. Um, uh, <laughs> and I'm not trying to sound like your parents, but uh, um, follow the law. <laughs> I mean, that sounds silly. That sounds silly, no. but I'm serious. Mm. Like f- be law abiding citizens, pay your taxes. Um, and, 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 um, you know, uh, develop your, develop character, you know, um, have integrity, um, be honest, don't lie. Mm. Um, all these things and they will matter in the workplace. Um, people will be able to tell, who, who is a man of character, who's a man of their word, um, um, and who isn't. And, um, and, um, oh, I can't stress this enough, but get to know your community, like yeah. your neighborhood, the small businesses in your neighborhood, um, um, donate and volunteer. Um, like I'm, I'm getting ready to, to, um, contact our, uh, uh, our Denver water. Cause I, in my spare time, I'm, I'm a fly angler and I want to help restore our rivers and stuff. A fly and wanna, angler, like a fisherman. Yeah. Fly oh, fishing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I, I want to help like, you know, restore some of our, um, you know, state parks and stuff. And, yeah. and, um, 
you know, uh, help your community, you know, yeah. and give, Oh, give back seriously, give back. And so, um, yeah, that's just personal advice. Yeah. That's all really sound advice. I love it. I love the integrity part too. I think not a lot of people and not enough people are, um, talking about things like that, that are extremely important. Um, so Bernard, Thank you so much for your time and sharing your life with us and your day to day. Um, if anybody has any more follow up questions or just interested in um, this this talk and this conversation, I want to encourage you to reach out to us at podcast wigu w i g u uh, for when I grow up at gmail dot com. And if I can't answer your questions. Maybe I can reach out to Bernard and he can help us out <laughs> with whatever we'll questions you might have. Um, but either way, Bernard, thank you so much once again. Oh, pleasure. Thanks for oh, having me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys, have a great week. Until next time. Bye.